Good morning, Good morning. Christopher. How, How are you? Doing, Joe? Well, if I'm to be honest, I feel a bit pants. I have felt pants all week. Um, my voice is not great. It's probably better than it was at the beginning of the week, but I can't sing. And I, no, I'm not really top notch, if the truth be known. But you know, how about you? I think I'm about a week ahead of you. Oh, are you? Okay. You so know, I had a really about last foul week. cold two weeks ago, and yeah. it was a bit pants last week. But I feel like I'm starting to improve now. Oh, there's hope for me yet, then. No, there's hope for you yet. So. Hopefully improving just in time for Christmas. Hooray. Yeah, we, can say that. we can say that word now, can't we? Because we're not that far off. Yeah, we're very, very near the fourth Sunday of Advent. Um, someone suggested I might not have a week off. <laughs> I thought, is, is that what our compatriot's doing? That is true. Perhaps I'll blame him for my lack of voice. Um, <clears throat> no, because, you see, our compatriot doesn't do quite as much school work as we do. That's because he does other things, not because he's a slacker, I should point out, because we divide our team up in different ways. So he, he did a lot of senior school stuff last week, but he doesn't do primary, so my week's been pretty dominated by primary schools. How's yours? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, just two nativities yesterday, and I've got a Chris Dingle this afternoon. So... I'm on carol service three and four today, I think. Oh, I haven't done any carol. No, I've had four services. this week. Mm. So, but I've got one every night next week. That's a killer. <laughs> oh, you need your voice for that. So if I do not know John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, off by heart. <laughs> in the beginning was the... Oh, uh, it'll it? come back to me in a minute. <laughs> Something about Jesus, isn't it? <laughs> I'd like you to do it in the original Greek. That would be good. Oh. Give everyone a little bit of a... That would wake everybody up, wouldn't it? Do you do authorised version? Are, are any of your churches uh, requiring you to read from the King James, or are you a NRSV guy? I do have some churches who require it from the authorised version. They tend to not get it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> congregation. I do think language needs to be a bit more accessible. Um, you know, as lovely as the old language is, there's a, there is an element of poetry about it, and me, you know, and the metre it does flow quite nicely. Mm. Um, Some kind of element I of understanding. In the modern world, we need to be talking in a way that people can understand a little bit more. Well, being that you are a TikTok vicar, I would expect nothing less. <laughs> My viewings dropped last week. I was down to oh. two hundred, down to two hundred again. I like my son who is um, chasing, actually, I think he's done it, he's chasing 100 subscribers for his YouTube channel by Christmas. I've got 103 yeah. followers on TikTok now. Oh, there you go. Fantastic. So another 40 to go and I'll have more TikTok followers than I'll have members of my benefits. That, that's very intriguing, isn't it? That's a whole new congregation. Yeah, but the TikTok followers pay zero towards parish share. <laughs> this is true which goes into a completely other equation which we won't go into it does, now, we're nearly it does. but you can reassure your benefits that they're subsidising mission if they want it to be like that maybe they don't you've heard it here first dear viewer right should we have our pause oh we should, well, yes oh, do we explain that Dave's not here Dave's not here yeah <laughs> that's fine I can't <laughs> remember fine. what we said we're all five minutes in. Let's have a pause. Right. I'm assuming you're expecting me to read. Of course. Of course. Matthew chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. 
But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. There we are. And what was your comment beforehand? God the spoiler. Yeah. So uh, I just was pondering, having read something yesterday, um, that basically Mary and Joseph were all set to just carry on in the way that they should. They're engaged, they're not yet married, um, they live in Nazareth, life is okay, presumably the families are supportive of the arrangement that they're to be together. Um, and then God comes and interrupts everything. And in a way that's not very helpful, really, because he uh, <laughs> impregnates Mary by the Holy Spirit, which is, you know, tricky, really, tricky for everybody. Poor old Joseph then, you know, he's plunged into turmoil. You know, does he believe his wife? No one else will believe her. What on earth is going to go on? She's now shameful. Um and he's, it, both of his options are pretty rubbish because he can either dismiss her, which potentially puts her life in threat, under threat for stoning, or he can marry her but then have to bring up someone else's child, which means that the heir to his line is potentially compromised, if that's important to him. And, yeah, it's just tough, isn't it? And he's got to base all his life decisions on a dream with an angel. I, you know... <laughs> It's not, not necessarily what he would have planned. So all of those of you who think that to be a Christian, life is rosy, you get married, have your 2.4 children, you have your one little house, a nice job, all things run smoothly, welcome to church. Yeah. Because actually, yes, I mean, a bit light-hearted, we might be blaming God for that. But actually, life's like that and that messiness for so many people. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. well, I'm sure there was a report that it has to be from the United States um, that there was something like three or four women a year claimed to be made pregnant by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's fascinating. But you can just imagine the debates with their boyfriend. <laughs> it can. Um, yeah. That's the, no, I, there's nobody else involved, honest. Yeah, no, honestly. And that, yeah. that thought must have gone through Josie's mind until the angel appeared. Of course. And um, the angel appeared. Um, <coughs> I mean, we talk a lot about angels. I, I have a bit of a, a, a catchphrase about, you know, which I think I've said before many times on Rev Chat, about the fact that the first words out of the mouths of angels is always, do not be afraid, which means that they must be blinking terrifying. And that every human that's ever come face to face with one of God's messengers is just like, whoa, please. And, um, you know, <laughs> it's just terrifying, isn't it? And so the, it, there's weird stuff happening. So not, yeah. I don't know how you visit. Um, you know, we've got two things, I suppose, to think of. Because this Sunday, not traditionally, we think about Mary, the mother of <laughs> Jesus. But most of this passage is about Joseph. Yeah. And you've got two things to think of here, you know. You can either put your cynical hat on and just say, well, Joseph had this really weird dream. Maybe he was on a, a psychotic substance, which convinced <laughs> had a him. bad week. Yeah, which convinced him to go ahead with it, and it was the Holy Spirit, and, oh, well, that, et cetera. You, know, you, you can go down that road quite easily. Or you could say, well, actually, there was something so amazing about the appearance of this angel which, because it's so out of this world, of course it would be scary. I think if we had an angel of God stand in front of us, 
yeah. we would be afraid. Um, that it actually convinced him that this is truth. Yeah. Which is probably your and my biggest challenge when we stand in the pulpit all over Christmas, however many times we do. It's we're asking the question, what is truth? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we had this discussion on the way to school this earlier in this week about how a lot of uh, Father Chris, a lot of Christmas tradition have myths attached to them. Um, and I don't want to know, I don't want to make a judgment on the age of our Rev Chat listeners, so I don't, viewers, so I don't want to spoil anybody's Christmas. But there's quite a lot of myth, myth involved, isn't there? Um, and the first myth, a favourite of Reverend Joe's before she goes any further, is donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But it's it's discerning what's true amongst the myths, isn't it? And 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 why does it matter? Because actually, well, this is my husband's favourite kind of description of it all. We don't really know what's true in the story of Jesus' birth. Because a lot of it is very convenient, you know? He needs to be born in Bethlehem because it's important that the Saviour has is descended from the house and lineage of David. And uh, it's beautifully symbolic that in those people who visited Jesus uh, represent the, the Gentiles and the Jews and the rich and the poor. And, you know, it's all very inclusive. It's brilliant. And let's hope, you know, it's true or if it's symbolic, that's great too. But at the heart of the story, is something about the divinity of, of Jesus Christ. And I guess that's, is that what we're trying to help people discern? You know, a baby was born 2,000 years ago. It's lovely. So we'll, we'll all dress up. We'll all, yeah, the donkey was there. And But if it's not just a myth and if it's not just a pretty story, what is the point? And I guess that is perhaps is what we're trying to steward people towards. Why does Jesus matter? So. There we go. That's my Christmas sermon written. I should just repeat your words. Well, like you say, you go from something very lighthearted. Is this myth? Is this true? Yeah. You know, we've started off with saying, well, you know, Joseph ha had to make this decision of what what is truth. Yeah. And actually, isn't that exactly the same question that we all have to ask the, ourselves? Yeah. And when we go to church on for a carol service, Christmas Day or whatever, or whether we even decide to go to church or not to go to church, ultimately we have to decide what is truth. Yeah. And then if you bring that right up to the modern world, TikTokers, social media, Facebook, Twitter, especially Twitter at the moment with the way um, the owner of Twitter, Twitter seems to be behaving, is the big decision there of what's true, what's fake, what do we believe, what do we not believe, is a real modern issue. Absolutely. Um, so Absolutely. to say that the Jesus story, the birth of Jesus, isn't related to modern issues, <clears throat> um, we still have the same things to decide 2,000 years later. What is truth? And, is and what... Form? Yeah, and once you've wrestled with whether this is any truth, and then then the the next question is, does it make any difference? Does it make what sense? difference does it make to you? And I guess that's the whole thing with Joseph, isn't it? He he had to wrestle with truth. You know, is she pregnant by the Holy Spirit? Is she pregnant by somebody else? Um, what am I going to do? Is that angel really from God? Did I imagine it? Was it real? But if I'm going to take all this at face value and I'm going to believe it, then it's going to change everything, and it did. It changed their lives in profound and amazing ways, but more amazingly, it changed the world. And so, you know, being a Christian, following God's way of living is highly inconvenient often, as poor old Joseph and Mary found, but life transforming. But life, yeah. And, I, you know, I suppose it brings to mind, I think, the, mo the most common comment I get is I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Which, on one level, is perfectly true. But if we want our Christianity to be life-transforming in the way that Joseph did, 
then actually gathering to worship God with fellow Christians is quite an essential part. Yeah. Well, and for me, it's what helps me make sense of it. Yeah. If I was just doing this on my own with God, I'd be forever feeling like Joseph did when he woke up from his dream. You know, is it real? Am I real? Did I imagine it? Is it what? And actually, you need the concrete experience of others, I think. Well, that's how it works in my family. And also being able to have a cup of coffee after church and discuss things. Yeah, absolutely. Not just theological things, but you're discussing modern life as well. Well, and just being friends and, and yeah. being you know, sharing some values. And we had a fascinating, we had a walk in Wednesday yesterday, had a really excellent conversation uh, about faith and migrants and wealth and the care system and uh, how we can, and nurses striking and uh, all those kind of things. And they would, it was just three people, three people of faith talking about the world and the stuff that we see and basically doing theological reflection, you know, where is God in it? And what do we think we should be doing? It's good stuff. Life-changing. Life-changing. It's a life-changing rev chat for you all, ladies and gentlemen. Excellent. Have a good think. Yeah, have a good point. I look there. forward to seeing you in one of the services, either in my benefice, Joe's benefice, David's benefice, we must cover about 20 odd churches between us, don't we? We do. And you can go to a carol service every night of next week in the Egerton and Commerce, <laughs> which, you know, if you were sure things to do, I, I think that's just glorious. You could do a carol service at night. I love it. Yeah, and if you go to a carol service every week next week, you will get the same brief talk from me, and you can take a notebook and pen and do a, a compare and contrast about the bits I add in and the bits I leave out from my notes. You can gauge the activity of the Holy Spirit in Chris Grask's preaching next week and see what's going on. <laughs> Blessings. It's been a glorious uh, little rev chat with you, Chris. It's always lovely to see you. And you. Have a good week, and uh, we'll see you next week for a happy Christmas special. Oh, see you all next week, dear viewer. Have fun. Bye. Bye.